for cultivating progress across the South, for working to unconditionally improve the lives of all, and for the bold underwriting of every gravy podcast. SFA thanks our visionary Louisville, Kentucky friends, Pam and Brooke Smith. It's wedding season, Mary Beth. Ask me how I know. Oh, I know how you know, Melissa. But tell the listeners. (laughs) Because last weekend, my oldest son got married. And wedding season means it's also catering season. Our family engaged two caterers for the weekend, one for the rehearsal dinner and another for the reception. And let's be fair, it's not just weddings. Many of life's big moments, graduations, sports banquets, award events, bat mitzvahs, all of those depend on catering for food service. And while regular home cooks, let's call them civilian cooks, have stories of specific moments when they made a lot of food for a whole bunch of people and lived to brag about it, for professional caterers, that work is just another day at the office. Caterers can serve two or 300 covers in a night without a restaurant to call home and often without a kitchen on site. Since this episode first aired in 2019, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed the fissures in the food industry. Catering and caterers took a particularly hard hit in the years where large gatherings were inconceivable. And yet, caterers did what caterers always do. They figured it out and kept moving on. Join us as we take another peek behind the pipe and drape. I'm Mary Beth Lassiter. I'm Melissa Hall. You're listening to Gravy. 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 A production of the Southern Foodways Alliance, Gravy tells the stories of the changing American South. Sarah Brooke Curtis has the story. Imagine yourself in a converted warehouse drinking a glass of bubbly at your cousin's lavish wedding. You're waiting for your dinner at your assigned table, surrounded by distant relatives having awkward conversations, maybe complaining about the lack of spicy tuna rolls or that the bridesmaids' dresses were too short. And then, all at once, the cater waiters swarm around your table in their choreographed dance. The meal is served. Have you ever wondered who makes that food? Where it's prepared? How it seems to almost magically materialize before your eyes? You're behind a pipe and drape, like literally a black furry drape that hides what you're doing. And it works to your benefit because it's messy back there and you're cursing and you're dribbling things and you're, you know, tipping over a tray of glasses and stuff. And so you don't want celebrants to know. But on the other hand, you want to accept the accolades if things go well, right? That's writer Matt Lee. I'm sitting with Matt and his brother and collaborator Ted in their office in Charleston, South Carolina. The air is humid and rich with the smell of peanuts because for the past 12 hours they've been boiling them in salt water in preparation for the Southern Renaissance Dinner at the 2019 Charleston Wine and Food Festival. An earthy, malty smell hangs over the room as Matt describes the high stakes involved at a catered event. The potential for horrific catastrophes hovers over all catered events because you've gathered everyone together, hundreds of people, and the expectation is simultaneous service. And so the pressure is on compared to a restaurant where, like, if something goes bad, it's just maybe a table or two that goes down and you have to apologize or call your lawyer about what if it's the entire, (laughs) the entire show? You know, I'm sorry, we won't be having dessert tonight. That You just can't do that. Though the stakes are high and the industry is massive, there's very little focus on how it all works and who's involved. Catering receives little media attention or critical conversation. Why is that? Plenty of talented chefs work in catering, but there really can't be much ego involved. Here's Ted. To a certain extent, if you, if you are working in catering, you're giving up the glory of press. So how do the Lee brothers, best known for their Southern cookbooks, know about the high-end catering industry? We researched and wrote Hotbox, a deep dive on the catering industry, how it works, functions, dysfunctions, and everything else you might want to know about this high-risk food industry. Matt and Ted Lee work in many areas of the food industry. They're best-selling cookbook authors, they teach cookbook writing seminars and cooking classes, 
They have a mail-order catalog for Southern food staples. They MC events, they reissue out-of-print cookbooks. So what inspired Matt and Ted to dedicate four years of their career to investigating the catering industry? Well, back in 2011, they attended a dinner at the James Beard House in New York City. They were there to support their friend Stephen Satterfield, the chef of Miller Union in Atlanta. Satterfield shared the bill with chef Justin Burdett, now of Crook's Corner in Chapel Hill. The two out-of-town chefs hired a New York City high-end catering firm to help execute the menu. The Lee brothers were blown away by what they witnessed. These three chefs came in whose way of dealing with food and cooking it and talking about it was so different than anything we had ever experienced. I mean, we, we knew enough chefs to kind of understand restaurant world, um, but this was something clearly very different. Here was Stephen Satterfield, who would later go on to win a James Beard Award. One of the most methodical chef, thinker, practitioners, just letting the reins go to three strangers, basically. Think of it from their perspective. They stepped in at 4.30 p.m. to a strange kitchen to cook food they had never cooked before. The dish, that idea of the perfect dish, the oxtail crepinette and the, the rabbit dish with this and this, and to be so fluent in the language of food that you could in a few minutes, absorb what this dish was trying to accomplish, and you knew how to put it together. After the event, they went out for some drinks with the catering chefs. How did you pull that off, they wanted to know. Here's Ted. We just marveled at how they could do this, and they said, you know, that was that was 80 covers we did, you know, five courses, 80 covers. We don't usually sweat until 850. And then it was like, well, how do you do that? And that's when we, we sort of said, you know, we'd love to, like, do a story. And, you know, as, as it turned out, there was really no room for a reporter with a notebook for a lot of reasons, primarily because these events tend to be discreet and that they, they don't want reporters, they don't want photographers. There's just no coverage of a private party. And also because there's no room in a lot of the places we were working. There's literally no room for a body who is not working and pushing the party forward. So we embedded For four years, they lived and breathed catering. They both got jobs at a high-end catering firm in New York City and went to work both in the off-site prep kitchen and at events in what's referred to as the Fiesta Kitchen. The Lee brothers have long been interested in the inner workings of the food and beverage industry. More than a decade ago, they wrote a column called The Industry for The New York Times, but this project was a departure from their more recent work. Here's Matt. I mean, all three of our first cookbooks have been about the South in some fashion. And it was New York City, for the most part, where the the pressures were just so intense. They're not being, uh, propane not being allowed, terrible electric grid, you know, expectations sky high, and just New York being New York. So how does food remain at the right temperature until it reaches the guest? The answer to that question became the book's title, Ted explains. It's a hack, basically. The whole way that gala food has been cooked in New York City for the past 40 years is is this hack. Sterno cans in an aluminum transport cabinet on wheels. And it's just sort of amazing because it was never designed to be an oven. A hot box is sort of shorthand for the aluminum transport cabinet. It's this five-foot-tall vessel notched on the inside to hold dozens of sheep hands. Once the food is par-cooked at the prep kitchen, it gets chilled in the walk-in. Then, at around 2.30 or 3 o'clock on the afternoon of the event, the Fiesta crew loads the hot boxes onto the catering trucks and drives them to the venue. Next, they pull the chilled food out of the hot box, and then it's transformed into a slow-warming oven, rewarming the par-cooked food to serving temperature by the time the food needs to be served. The crazy thing is that the hot box is solely heated by Sterno, You know, those little gel fuel cans. It has no power at all. There's no thermometer in it. So it's all, the people who run them are all relying on experience and their wits to bring everything, you know, touch, sound, you know, it's it's all sensory. It's all sensory controls. And it's it's a very efficient machine, though. If you have to do 1,400 orders of lamb chops in a very small amount of space, In a place where, you know, you can't use electricity, you can't use propane because it's against fire codes, this is the way you're going to do it. Before the 1960s, you would never have a catered event staged in a place like a museum or a park. 
If you wanted to hire a firm to cook for your wedding, it had to be held in places with kitchens. Here's Matt. And the idea of doing, you know, a $1,000 a ticket, high ambition, multi-course, sit-down meal, simultaneous service for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people in a place that had no running water, to say nothing of electricity or heat or gas, it was absurd. But then, in the 1970s, a handful of enterprising, imaginative, and not to mention competitive, Manhattan caterers busted out of banquet halls and private clubs and hotel ballrooms. And then it became possible. And then the bar got raised. And then the clients expected that. And then why not have a bar mitzvah for 4,000 people in a public park with no resources at all? You you know, it's it's like a military campaign. And that's why that military connection kind of makes sense. You're moving an entire kitchen on the double. You you can load in after 2 p.m. And that thing has to be swept clean by midnight. So... How do you do it? Matt and Ted began to see that the unique working conditions of the industry attracted certain types of chefs. Here's Matt. We found some commonalities, especially when we started digging into the history of people with backgrounds in either the military or theater or both. And in fact, a ton of them have both. They're military brats who also did theater, or they did USO tours, or something like that. Catering chefs must thrive on being in a different place every day and working with a different crew of people all the time. They build a little world only to break it down at the end of the night. They can't really form attachments to their work home or their work family or to perfecting that signature dish on the menu because everything shifts all the time. It's all about improv and adaptability. Improv and adaptability within a cooking framework that's presumed to be the most boring. Remember that about the impression that people outside catering have about catering, which is that it's rubber chicken and overcooked salmon and it's dumb food. Why would I ever do that? I'm a creative chef. And it's like, well, listen, you should try it because it's seat of pants. It's incredible. And you have to be super smart about food and menu design. There should be a James Beard Award for these people because they, they do heroics on a daily basis. When we come back, our reporter, Sarah Brooke Curtis, explores the democratic nature of the catering kitchen. It may look like a restaurant kitchen, but it doesn't act like one. But first... For over 125 years, Lodge has been crafting quality cookware in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. It started with the iconic Lodge cast iron skillet made for cooking anything anywhere and then turned to the seasoned cast iron Dutch oven and camp ovens. Now Lodge is making history with USA Enamel, the only line of colorful enameled cast iron made in the United States. And like all Lodge cast iron cookware, USA Enamel is designed to last for generations. Visit LodgeCastIron.com to purchase your own USA Enamel Dutch oven. For Lodge's longtime commitment to the Southern Foodways Alliance and this podcast, we thank them. Being a home cook is the antithesis of the -the always-on-the-move caterer. When you're without the comforts of your own kitchen to cook from and a known audience to cook for, you're left with a very different approach to and motivation for cooking. While Matt and Ted immersed themselves in the world of catering, they both struggled with the disconnect between process and outcome. Here's Matt. For home cooks, there's a gratification at the end of every meal. And, you know, you've shared it with your family and your kids and and they liked it or didn't like it or whatever, but kind of you have that closure. In catering, we started off in the prep kitchen. You don't know where those diced carrots are going. You simply don't know. And, you know, don't ask because no one knows. But you have just spent the last four hours turning your fingertips orange you know, chopping yourself into a trance, creating 60 quart containers of finely uh, minced carrots. Then you get to the site and the dish has to come together, but you don't know who did the prep. And so you kind of don't know what to expect when you open that cooler. Ted has always been drawn to the stories that food can tell. Working in catering, he felt that he'd lost that thread. When we write a recipe, Everything about the recipe, I mean, there's something in the recipe itself that's fantastic, you know, that we trust in. But we also need to tell the story of how that recipe works in our cooking lives to the reader so that they understand and they can incorporate it into their own life. And there's so much storytelling going on in passing food back and forth. And that's the part that's so frustrating about 
catering is it's like, it's not about the story. The story happens at a level that's so far removed from where you are as a kitchen laborer that it's so, it's, it's hard. The prep chefs taught the Lee brothers that it's a privilege, not a given, to be able to focus on the story or on the food you're making. In catering, for the most part, the story belongs to the client. In the kitchen, you have to stay somewhat detached and just focus on executing the task at hand. That disconnect between the routineness of it for everyone making the food happen and the yeah, rah, 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 yay, you know, for everyone celebrating on the other side of the pipe and drape was poignant. The Lee brothers marveled over the skills of the prep chefs, or KAs as they're nicknamed, short for kitchen assistants. They learned from their scrappiness, their endurance, their ability to anticipate, and their teamwork. Here's Matt. In catering, the level of teamwork is higher than in most industries, and it's sink or swim. Like, if you can't be a positive asset to the team, you get kind of moved out by the team. (laughs) Matt says that catering kitchens in New York, which are largely staffed by Mexican-American chefs, cherish the idea of chef completo, the idea that every KA is a complete chef. They must be trained and empowered to play any role in the kitchen at any time. The KAs don't really compete. Except insofar as you compete with each other to out-anticipate and assist the other people. You just sort of show like, oh no, I got you, man. I I brought my tweezers or whatever. Or don't worry about that. You know, I I got a backup over here for you. I already created the backup you didn't ask me for because I knew this moment was coming and now I got you. So your life is easier. Yeah. The Lee brothers want people to know about the catering industry because it's full of hardworking, talented chefs that get little, if any, recognition. Still, say Matt and Ted, these chefs matter. They once watched in awe as a KA named Gustavo Zapeda, in hour three of an epic prosciutto slicing operation, took two Ziploc bags full of ice, tied them together at one corner, and draped them over the motor of the meat slicer, which had been overheating and tripping the safety switch. No one told him to do it. He just figured out what it took to get the job done. It's an attitude in the catering kitchen as much as a skill set. Restaurant chefs and catering chefs hone very different skills, and the catering life doesn't always work for the restaurant chef. Here's Matt. What restaurant chefs dislike about catering is it's the same dish being served to 700 people simultaneously. But I would say that I, th- I don't think a catering chef could just step into or onto a restaurant line and be like, oh, great, now I'm making all these dishes to order. That would be completely paralyzing. But listen, Ted, I would place my bet on a catering chef working in a restaurant kitchen to have greater success than a restaurant chef working in a catering environment. Ted agrees with Matt and then heads over to the pot of boiling peanuts to see if they're ready. With the popularity of food festivals, more and more restaurant chefs are being pushed to cater, to leave their traditional, comfortable cooking environment and make something delicious on location. I'm tagging along with the Lee brothers to the Southern Renaissance event at Charleston Wine and Food. Fine dining chefs, celebrated cookbook authors, and popular food truck proprietors are preparing to serve around 500 guests in a vast parking lot that's been dressed up for the evening. Perhaps knowing how many obstacles could arise, Matt and Ted chose to keep their offering relatively simple. Perfectly boiled peanuts cooked with a pork leg. Their table was stationed next to Deborah Van Treese, owner of Twisted Soul Restaurant in Atlanta, Georgia, who was confronting some initial obstacles. Well, right now we've got to find a plug because we need electricity for the heat lamp that the cheese wheel is going to go under and then the grits go inside the cheese wheel. So, you know, so we can make them cheese grits as we're playing along. So that's our challenge right now. You got here and it's like, okay, found my spot. Now we're like, all right, we need electricity. After prepping her bouillabaisse for six hours in a prep kitchen, chef and cookbook author Virginia Willis nervously awaits the delivery truck, which is already 17 minutes late. I realize now it's windy, you know, and those butane burners are not going to be working just right. I'm starting, I'm starting to, yeah, like my anxiety level is really starting to go up. Deborah has experience in both catering and restaurants, so she's feeling confident about handling whatever comes her way. You know, sometimes I watch, I see other people, and they're searching for this and searching for that. 
And it's like, you know, from doing so much off-premise catering, you get where you got band-aids, you know, you know everything you possibly could need and you're always prepared for it, you know, a little bit extra. And if you're not, then you got somebody with the car that's ready to roll to go get what you need. I check in with Matt, who's using a twisted up piece of paper towel to skim some foam off the surface of their pot of boiled peanuts. Create a pointer out of... One of the many quick hacks he learned from the prep chefs in the catering kitchen. Barely touch the surface. It's a warm evening and the light is perfect. Every once in a while, the wind picks up and causes a momentary panic for the chefs trying to maintain their burners. The parking lot is full of excited and hungry guests, most of whom are dressed to the nines. There's a band playing some bluegrass music, a couple dances. I watch chef Shui Wong and his wife and business partner Corey Wong build their crispy lamb shoulder tacos with Szechuan pepper pimento cheese. They're working so fast building the same taco over and over again for a long line of people, drinking wine, kissing, and gossiping about which dish was the best. Here's Deborah again. Events are sexy, you know, and people don't, I don't think they realize how much work it goes. They take it for granted. It just happens that way. Yeah, but the planning of pulling off an event and serving great food to a lot of people yeah, you know, it takes a lot. It takes a lot. And unfortunately, caterers don't get you know, the accolades at all. Until I got a restaurant, people wouldn't even refer to me really as a chef. So just the change of location now you know, makes me become a chef. I do a final swoop of the parking lot, sampling food from chefs like Chidi Kumar, Rodney Scott and Stephen Satterfield, before finding my way back to Matt and Ted. Matt's filling up a cup of peanuts for a woman who's giddy because they remind her of her childhood. They make time to share stories before breaking down their stations. Sarah Brooke Curtis is an award-winning radio producer. Her work is aired on The Splendid Table, KCRW's Unfictional, KCRW's Good Food, CBC's Love Me, BBC's Shortcuts, among others. That's a lot of letters. (laughs) She loves recording sounds of everyday life and producing sonic worlds for listeners to surrender to and delight in. Special thanks go to Stephen Satterfield, Virginia Willis, Matt Bolas, Schwa and Corey Wang, Chidi Kumar, Vishwish Bot, and Eddie Hernandez. We thank Wendell Patrick for Gravy's theme music. We also owe a thank you to Clay Jones and Broadcast Studios for recording and mixing Gravy. Managing editor for Gravy and all other SFA media is Sarah Camp Milam. Olivia Terenzio is our podcast editor. Fact checking comes courtesy of Heather Cole. My co-host, Mary Beth Lassiter, is our publisher. Want to learn more about the changing American South? Visit us at southernfoodways.org. Read oral histories, watch films, or listen to this podcast. While you're there, become a member or make a donation. Your dollars fund our documentary work and help us make more gravy. I'm Melissa Hall. I'm Mary Beth Lassiter. Excited to lap up another episode of Gravy? Tell a friend. Pass the gravy boat. There's plenty to go around. Gravy is proud to be a part of APT Podcast Studios.